then tell us what is happening. And so we need to have the whistleblowers and we need to have institutions they can tell their story to and they can tell their story to the superiors in the Defense Department or the State Government uh, or State Department or the government that in general. Hi, everybody. Hope you're having a good night tonight. I'm having a wonderful evening myself. Oh, wait, I forgot to do something. Hang on just a second. I'll be right back. There we go. I think that looks a little better, right? How do I sound, everybody? Hope the sound is good. Greg says good evening. Dolores, hi all. Lana Dell says greetings.
please share, like, and subscribe. Especially share for right now. Thank you for sharing. Okay, so today I started out my day by doing a little Twitter work. And it was Lana who got me there. She tagged me on Twitter. Actually, it was yesterday that this all started. She tagged me on Twitter. And I got involved in some back and forth uh, with some of the UBI folks, the Yang Ganger Bangers, <laughs> as I guess they're called. At times. And this led me to three questions that I wanted to ask. Uh, one of them claimed that um, Andrew Yang had said, Oh, hi, Jimmy Sunderland. Um, Andrew Yang had said, that uh, the uh, that, uh, that freedom dividend uh, would not be taxed. Uh, that the thousand dollars a month was tax free. And I thought that was a bit strange. So I went to Andrew's website. And I wasn't able to find anything that said that uh, the UBI was tax-free. So a couple of the UBI people on Twitter uh, replied to my comment about this and said, oh yes, Andrew Yang has clarified that it is tax-free. So being a skeptic by nature, I guess, I think it's my training in the social sciences and in the scientific method and in the philosophy of science, um, I said, uh, please, may I have a link, please? In my usual rather polite way. And so... Uh, one of them was kind enough to provide me a link uh, to an interview show in which Andrew Yang was being um, interviewed by Charlemagne the God. <laughs> which is always interesting. Not the most uh, studious show in the world, I don't think, but uh, always uh, somewhat interesting. And Charmaine, uh, the guard, um, asked him the question whether it was taxable. And he confirmed, oh, oh yeah. The, uh, the, uh, the dividend won't be taxed. It's a different category of income. So it won't be taxed. <laughs> so Lana says, you are way more polite and patient than I am. That's because I'm older, Lana. <laughs> and so, uh, it was kind of an offhand comment by Andrew. He didn't really emphasize it a lot. And he didn't say, that it was going to be free of income tax. He also didn't say it was going to be free from the pass-throughs coming out of value-added taxes, because, of course, his plan calls for assessing value-added taxes on people. And the general feeling about um, the value-added taxes is that they are 
extremely uh, regressive. We'll take that up okay, in a little while. But for now, I want to point out that in the absence of anything on his website um, actually addressing that statement, and any may, um, um, anything in the political debates where he's come out and flatly said that the 1000 a month won't be subject to, uh, to income taxes, I still wonder whether that is what Andrew Yang actually meant. And so that's one of my questions. I'd really like him to clarify whether he is saying that that $1,000 for everybody will not be subject to federal income taxes. So, note uh, the following. Uh, the higher up the income scale uh, you are, generally speaking, and since, um, as we know, the actual tax rates for extremely rich people are um, um, very, very low. It's likely that even if the, ba uh, uh, the, uh, the UBI was subject to taxation, the rich would get more to keep of it than much of the middle class would anyway. Because if a person um, in the middle class is operating at a marginal tax rate of, let's say, 25%, then that 1000 a month is only worth $750 a month okay, to them. Of course, uh, those at the bottom of the scale um, um, but don't have to worry about that. Uh, their tax rate on the thousand dollars would probably be pretty low anyway once they take various family deductibles off uh, they probably won't have to worry too much but uh, the fact is that it still is useful to know for people considering uh, the, uh, the UBI okay as legislation uh, Who's going to benefit the most on a proportional basis from getting a UBI? Which income groups are going to benefit the most okay, from having the UBI? And of course, well, this is going to differ um, but, uh, depending on whether there is any tax on it um, or not. Uh, so that was my first question about it. I didn't think that question was satisfactorily answered. Lana says, I think he is uh, FOS. And I think we all know what FOS actually means. I also had a second question about uh, the UBI. And that second question was, what about variations in the cost of living? Wouldn't major cities need much more money than the rural areas? And on his website, Andrew Yang says, every eligible UBI recipient, regardless of location, would receive 1000 a month. Varying the dollar amount by location would add expensive layers of um, by, uh, by, uh, uh, the bureaucracy. Well, 
I suppose right there I have a question about that. I don't know why um, it really would. In other words, the checks uh, can be adjusted starting at a base of a thousand a month. For low cost areas, the thousand a month could be adjusted down. And for high cost areas, okay, it could be adjusted up. It could all be done by computer. It could all be done based on the CPI. And uh, the checks would be printed out accordingly. It seems to me it's all done in software. I don't see adding to the bureaucracy. It seems to me the whole thing can easily be handled by the bureaucracy we already have at Social Security. So, I guess I don't really see this idea it's going to add expensive layers to the bureaucracy. I don't think that that sounds very plausible to me. He says, plus the freedom dividend would actually help many more Americans live where they want to. Well, that may be so, but it doesn't change the fact that... The constant figure of 1000 a month goes a lot farther in the rural areas and in various segments and sections of the country than it does in the urban areas and in the Northeast and in the West Coast in California okay, and uh, Oregon. Uh, we all know there are variations, and we know the variations in the cost of living are major from area to area. So the basic income, the universal basic income, is just an unequal dividend depending on where you live. So... Andrew Yang says, the freedom dividend will actually help many more Americans live where they want to. Well, it certainly would be better than nothing. But if the many more Americans would rather live in Colorado as opposed to Flint, Michigan, or places like that, then a constant UBI at 1000 a month doesn't really help them to live better in Colorado or to live better where the water systems are good as opposed to being driven to live in the Flint, Michigan of the United States because prices are lowest there uh, because one's life is in more danger because the water has let in it. Andrew says, the Census Bureau shows Americans are moving between states at the lowest levels on record, contributing to a stagnant economy and a labor market that's also stagnant. Well, I think they are, because the economy is already stagnant. And since it is already stagnant, maybe they don't see much advantage in moving to other areas, as long as the whole economy is pretty stagnant. I don't know, Andrew says correctly. Moving requires a lot of money up front, and Americans are increasingly strapped for cash. Uh, UBI would make people and families more mobile and improve the dynamism of the labor market as people seek out new environments, gain opportunities. 
Well, the UBI, if given to people um, over 18, from 18K and over, to be accurate, is going to total, in terms of expense for the federal government, $3.05 trillion per year. Wouldn't it improve the dynamism of the labor market uh, much more if people were making, instead of an additional 1000 a month, if they could move to areas which were very dynamic because there, were, there was no unemployment in those areas, because all the people who wanted to work were making, if it's $15 an hour, um, but $2,600 a month. If it's $20 an hour, they'd be making even more than that. Uh, more like, what would that be, $3,200 a month? I don't know. I have to multiply it out to see. But uh, the point is, if you make sure that those who want to work can always find a job at a living wage, whatever that level of the living wage is, and make those jobs available to them wherever they are or wherever they want to move to so that people have a living all over the country. And you make that cost of living adjusted. So while it might be an average of 2600 a month, but it might go much higher if they want to move to New York City or much lower Okay, if they want to move, uh, let's say, to the middle of Kansas, somewhere. Uh, when that creates still more dynamism in the economy, if our objective is to improve the dynamism of the labor market and allow people to seek out new environments and um, opportunities, if the good opportunities are existing in, uh, let's say, Burlington, Vermont, wouldn't it be nice if people could have a living wage in Burlington, Vermont, in the Burlington, Vermont, if they wanted to, or if they could have a living wage? in Portland, Oregon, if they wanted to. So Andrew says, 1,000 a month goes farther in some places than in others. I agree. The Freedom Dividend would lead to a revitalization of many communities as people take advantage of lower costs of living in certain areas instead of piling into the expensive metro areas. Well, it would be good to revitalize the, uh, the rural areas, but it seems to me you would do so just as well by making jobs available at a living wage in all of the rural areas, as well as in all of the urban areas of the United States, so that people could have their free choice. I thought the Freedom Dividend was about giving people more choice. But it seems that since 1000 a month goes, as, goes further in some places than in others, and specifically goes further in the more depressed places in the United States, that you're providing people an incentive to move to the depressed places in the United States, whether they want to or not. 
And if even with the 1000 a month additional, they still can't afford to live in the place they want to live in, they would then be forced into moving to places they don't have any desire to move to. Thus, all of a sudden, with the UBI, you're not talking about trying to maximize their freedom. You're talking about trying to push them back into Flint. As opposed to a JG with a regional cost adjustment, that is a regional cost of living adjustment, which lets them go everywhere you want or they want to. Also, a JG for everybody would probably stabilize, in my calculations, and I know some of the MMT economists have gone far lower than that, uh, offering a figure of $250 billion a year. Um, I have higher living wages in mind because it cost adjusted, so um, I use a figure of $400 billion a year. But in any case, whether it's $250 billion a year or $400 billion a year, that's far less federal policy space expended than would be expended by spending $3.05 trillion, right? So... It seems to me that you get a result of revitalizing the rural communities in the United States anyway, uh, just by doing a living wage and having a job guarantee, and that it is far less costly and reserves um, the dollars, whether deficit spending dollars or non-deficit spending dollars, reserves those for um, other policies, such as the Green New Deal. Of course, the job guarantee is part of the Green New Deal, but the Green New Deal as a whole is going to be enormously expensive. And that $3.05 trillion that is spent, um, spent on a basic income takes away an enormous amount okay, of policy space. And that is the case so that people who do not need the $12,000 a year, the extra $12,000 a year, can get that extra $12,000 a year. Which leads us to the next question that I have, and that is, it's addressed on Andrew's site, and it says, why would you give the basic income to the rich? By giving everyone the freedom dividend, the stigma for accepting tr cash transfers from the government uh, disappears. Also, it removes the incentive for anyone to remain within income brackets to receive benefits. If it's paid for by a value-added tax, as in um, 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 Andrew's plan, a wealthy person will likely pay more into the system than he or she gets out of it. Okay, let's address those claims. Uh, one at a time. How is there a stigma for accepting 
a cash payment um, um, from the government uh, for an alternative program like a job guarantee. Why is there a stigma actually attached to that? And who knows about that stigma anyway? If a person working for the job guarantee program is doing something socially valuable for the community, why should there be a stigma attached to that? The person would be earning a living wage and no one would know anyway where the paycheck is coming from because presumably the person with a living wage would be able to bank the cash payment in a normal way well once every two weeks and then draw out what they need to spend on their living expenses where is the stigma I don't see why there would be a greater stigma in working for the job guarantee program than there is in working for Walmart or working for Target or working in some other low-end job. Why is there a greater stigma working at a job that produces benefits for local communities that are agreed on benefits by the various local stakeholders. In other words, the stakeholders decide what the benefits are of certain activities. Jobs are created by them. And those jobs get filled. Why is there a stigma as long as the activities are producing something of value for the community? I don't get it. I don't know what he's thinking. So then he, um, he says, additionally, it removes the incentive for anyone to remain within certain income brackets in order to receive benefits. Well, once again, relative to the JG, um, I don't see where that actually enters into the situation. If someone wants to leave the JG and go to a better job, uh, they'd be getting paid more. There would be no incentive to stay at the JG to remain within a certain income bracket. In other words, the incentive coming from that comes from taxes. It doesn't come from uh, the payments from the federal government um, at a living wage for the job guarantee work. So then Andrew said, if it's paid for by a value added tax as an Andrew's plan, a wealthy person will pay more into the system than he or she gets out of it. I guess I don't see that either, because is he saying that value-added tax is going to raise the whole $3.05 trillion uh, to pay for basic incomes to millions and millions and millions of people who do not need those basic incomes? Now, I don't know where the cutoff is. I have no idea what, where the cutoff is or should be. And maybe there shouldn't be a cutoff as such. In other words, maybe everybody should get uh, $1,000 a month and then have that subjected to income taxes where that 
about thousand dollars a month would be subject to the highest of tax rates if the individual was in the highest um, um, tax bracket and to the lowest of tax rates okay, if they were not. I mean, what's wrong with that? It's generally recognized that a value added tax is a regressive tax. That it costs people at the lower end of the scale more than it costs people at the higher end of the scale. He's pulling a trick here. He's saying wealthy people will likely pay more. But I don't think they'll pay more as a percentage of their income, Andrew. They may pay more, absolutely, because they buy a yacht. But it's unlikely they're going to pay more um, um, into the system um, on a proportional basis. Because that's not what the value added tax is about. That's not how it works in Europe. We know it's a regressive tax in Europe. It may raise scads and scads of money over there. But it is a regressive tax. The evidence is clear on that. What we mean by a regressive tax is that the poor ending up paying more into the system one way or another than uh, the middle class. Okay. And the middle class then pays more than the rich. So those are some questions I had on the basic income as a result of my exchanges with the Yang Gangers today. I hope the questions are of use to you. And I hope the implied answers are of use to you. I'll also add that during my Twitter exchanges with them, I kept on trying to make them see that it was a better deal for people, even for stay-at-home um, parents and for caregivers, to have a basic income at two-thirds of the living wage from the job guarantee rather than having a thousand dollars a month. And I did my calculations and in, in the scenario where people are making on the JG 2600 a month, I pointed out they'd be making $1,733 a month if we had a basic income supplementing the JG, but a basic income which was not a universal basic income. In other words, it would only go to people who needed it because they didn't have any other source of income. As, for example, a stay-at-home uh, um, parent might not have any other source of income. And I pointed out to them that stay-at-home parenting or caregiving might become defined jobs under the JG. They could become that because... Uh, the local stakeholders would be free to define them that way. However, however, if the local stakeholders decided not to do that, sorry, I hope I'm still coming in clear here. I forgot to keep my screen active, so my energy saver kicked in for a minute. Uh, so anyway, if the local stakeholders decided not to define caregiving as a job that was worthy of the job guarantee, that under my plan for a job guarantee with the basic income, it would still be possible for the stay-at-home uh, caregivers who had no other means of support to get two-thirds of what uh, the JG would give them, or 1733 a month, 
And I pointed out easily that uh, that would be $733 a month more than the $1,000 a month of uh, the Freedom Dividend. Somehow, that point um, didn't appear to, to convince them. They presented me with an example showing me a graphic comparing the basic income or the universal basic income of 1000 a month with uh, the minimum wage. And they made certain assumptions in that context uh, that uh, but did not apply to the JG. <laughs> uh, for example, uh, they estimated that uh, the amount of work, okay, that Americans did was something like, I think they used the figure, 1,733 hours uh, per year, okay, of work. And they did their calculations. Uh, with respect to uh, the, uh, the minimum wage of $15 an hour based on 1,733 uh, hours of work uh, per year because that was what the average American worked. Of course, I pointed out to them that under the JG, uh, the average American would be paid for 2,080 hours a year. In other words, they still might work 1,733 hours a year, but they would be paid for 2,080 hours because the JG covered holidays and vacations and good things like that and paid people for those, paid family leave and so on. So, but somehow they just didn't see it. They thought somehow... If people had a regular job at $7.25 an hour, and they also had the basic income, they would always come out ahead. Strange thinking, I thought. Strange thinking. And especially when you consider that they'd be subject to a value-added tax to pay for this. So in the end, I had to figure, to estimate, what it would probably cost if people were getting a cost-adjusted job guarantee at a living wage, cost-adjusted to pay for regions, and also the 5 million people or so who wanted a BI uh, could also have a BI. And I came up with a figure, a loose estimate anyway that that would probably cost $600 billion per year to give people the combination of the job guarantee with the, uh, the BI. Still, less than one-fifth of the cost of uh, the basic income. And much more benefit out of it, I think, um, to boot. So that's what I want to say about the basic income today. I want to mention a few news items also. Uh, before I close the show, let me shift my view here. I should have done this already. I'm showing you Yang's website, but I didn't actually do that, so forgive me. But here I am on um, some of the articles. Let me first show you. This is Common Dreams, published on October 22nd, written by Jake Johnson. And Jake was talking about the results of a poll, and the title is Sanders Dominates Youth Vote and Regains Second Spot in New National 2020 Poll. And he says, 
Senator Bernie Sanders has regained the number two spot in the 2020 Democratic presidential primary and continues to dominate the field. Let me go back to clearly here. Continues to dominate the field among young voters, according to a national Emerson tracking poll released on Tuesday. The survey showed a tight race at the top of the Democratic primary, with former Vice President Joe Biden polling at 27 percent, Sanders at 25 percent, and Senator Elizabeth Warren at 21 percent. The margin of error was 4.7 percentage points. So... Uh, it could be the case that Sanders is first at this time. It also could be the case that Sanders would be last at this time. Okay, and then Elizabeth Warren would be second. But the probabilities are very low that Elizabeth Warren would be first at this point because the margin of error is only 4.7% and Biden's figure is outside of the margin of error here. The poll puts Sanders support among voters from the ages of 18 to 29 at 45%, with Warren Biden trailing <coughs> far behind at 17 and 12%, uh, respectively. Now that makes some sense, though I don't see why anybody ages 18 to 29 uh, would be voting for Biden. It seems to me that 12% figure may be a little high, but who knows? <laughs> Quote, I'm not an avid rider of the polar coaster, <laughs> but young people across the country have consistently chosen Bernie as their guy, unquote, tweeted Winnie Wong, Sanders' senior political advisor. Uh, quote again, maybe it's because they know he's going to cancel student debt, all student debt, every student debt, for every student. Sanders gained three percentage points overall since Emerson's September survey, released just days before the Vermont senator was hospitalized for his heart attack, his minor heart attack. The Emerson survey <coughs> comes in the wake of a strong and energetic performance by Sanders last week at the 2020 Democratic presidential debate in Ohio. And after the senator had a Bernie's back rally in New York on Saturday that was attended by over 25,000 people, and Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez officially endorsed Sanders at the event, applauding his, quote, Enormous, consistent, and nonstop, unquote, work to build a mass progressive movement. Yes, he was even working as he lay in his hospital bed, um, pointing out to people that it's a lucky thing. He had the kind of care they would be getting under Medicare for All, if they had Medicare for All. It is a lucky thing, because otherwise he might be gone by now. In a series of tweets on Tuesday, journalist Walker Bragman said, the new Emerson survey is evidence of the resiliency of Sanders' campaign in the face of powerful uh, um, opposition. I would say not so powerful for most of the other candidates, but more from the powerful forces standing behind the opposition, first propping up one candidate, and then another candidate, and then another candidate, uh, against uh, um, by Bernie Sanders, whose job it is to knock down the mainstream dominoes. Anyway, quote, Bernie Sanders has had the entire D.C. establishment, politicians, operatives, and media against him for four years now, unquote, said uh, uh, Walker Bragman. Quote again, he's been ignored, dismissed, and smeared, on top of it, he's even had a heart attack, and yet he's still polling number two nationally within the margin of error of uh, number one. And he added, no other candidate running has been so resilient. Bernie holds the largest rallies, has by far the largest donor network, excites young people, 
and has been shown to perform best against Trump in states like Texas and uh, Wisconsin. So, we now come to another news article I wanted you to know, and this one was, is important because it makes, underlines a very important point, which has recently been made quite frequently, and there of course is uh, October 23rd this was. And it starts over the quote and the headline, we need, um, we need Medicare for all, unquote. Uh, okay. Um, uh, back, um, back, um, so progressives condemn a Bezos decision to shift more health insurance costs onto Washington Post staffers. And this one was written also by Jake Johnson. Let's get it on clearly. In the Washington Post, owned by world's richest man, Jeff Bezos is reportedly moving most of its staff onto what one Post journalist described as, quote, high deductible health insurance plans that shift significant costs and risks onto employees, unquote. Uh, which was a decision that, that, that Medicare for All proponents highlighted as a prime example of the instability and injustice of the employer-sponsored health care system, that is frequently praised by centrist Democratic um, the presidential candidates. Yes, that is a very, very central point. If you've got good health insurance, um, even when you love it, there's no guarantee you'll have it tomorrow or next week or next month um, 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 or next year. The Washington Post Guild, the union that represents Post employees, sent an email Tuesday informing members that, quote, the company announced changes to our health care plans for next year. <clears throat> the news is that the health plan that two-thirds of Post employees have now, the Aetna Health Fund, is going away, and your reserve health um, the fund monies will not roll over. So in other words, monies they paid in are not going to roll over into the new insurance. They would have lost those monies. They've lost those monies. And the opponents of Medicare for All, such as former Vice President Joe Biden in South Bend, Indiana, Mayor Peter uh, Buttigieg, often argue a single-payer system would deprive people of the choice to keep their private insurance if they are satisfied with their coverage. Of course, though, Mayor Pete, last January, was all for Medicare for all single-payer. He had no words for simply strengthening the Affordable Care Act. He was a single-payer advocate all the way down the line. There was nothing else to be considered according to him. Now, 10 months later, or nine months later, he's arguing the exact opposite. I should have said, and what, um, $40 million in contributions later from the rich? Huh. As Matt Brunig of the People's Policy Project has pointed out, this argument ignores the fact that under the current employer-sponsored insurance system, people don't have the choice to keep their plan if their boss decides to change it. Yes, this is not about choice for you. It's about choice for your employer. 
not about choice for you. Quote, the only way to stop that from happening to people is to create a seamless system where people do not constantly churn on and off of insurance, said Bruning. Earlier this year, quote, uh, Medicare for All offers that. Our current system offers the exact opposite. If you like losing your insurance all the time, then our current health care system is the right one for you, unquote. Medicare for All supporters on Tuesday echoed Brunig in response to the Post decision to dramatically alter staffers' health insurance plans. Kenneth Zinn, political director at uh, the National Nurses United, the NNU, said the Post move is, quote, one more example of why employer-based health care is not stable and not just, unquote. Of course it's not just. Jeff Bezos, the richest man in America, gets to decide on a whim whether Washington Post employees get to see a doctor or not. Unquote, Zinn tweeted. Bernie Sanders said, quote, We shouldn't allow Jeff Bezos or any other boss to choose their profits over workers' health care. Unquote. Quote, We need Medicare for all. Unquote said Sanders. According to an Emerson poll released on Tuesday, 70% of U.S. voters strongly oppose allowing employers to, quote, change or eliminate an employee's health insurance. Um, to, uh, to change or eliminate an employee's health insurance against the employee's wishes, unquote. In response to the survey, Brunig tweeted, Quote, voters strongly oppose employer-based health insurance once they understand what it means, unquote. Of course, Biden and Buttigieg and Harris and Yang and others who are talking about Medicare for this and Medicare for that and Medicare for all for those who want it and um, and BS, 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 and all that are trying to confuse people about what Medicare for all means, trying to change their understanding, trying to harm their understanding. It's up to us to counter the lies and to stop them from doing this and to make sure everybody understands that what Medicare for All does is cover everyone in the country um, automatically and eliminate premiums, co-pays, and also deductibles. And it also provides them that health care uh, um, 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 in perpetuity for every basic service and every drug, every pharmaceutical they need. Except in Bernie's plan, there is a $200 a year deductible uh, for pharmaceuticals. That has never made sense to me, but if you don't like that and you don't like the four-year transition period, there's always the Premier Lejayapal bill in the House to support, which has only a two-year transition period and has no deductibles for pharmaceuticals and no co-pays and no premiums. So... Second piece of news I wanted you to see. And the third piece of news, you know, the significance of which is, I believe this sort of thing is going to start going on in many, many places all over the country. And that in this case, 
of New York's 16th Congressional District, showing a troubling early poll for a longtime incumbent, um, Elliot Engel in this case, that this is not going to be an uncommon scenario across the United States this year. This article was written for The Intercept, okay, by Akila Lacey. And let's go through it and sketch out the picture. Six in ten registered Democrats in New York's 16th Congressional District aren't sure who they'll vote for in the June 2020 primary. Despite longtime incumbent House Foreign Affairs Chair uh, Elliot Engel's place um, on, on the ballot, according to a new poll from Data for Progress. We have to know, okay, Elliot Engel is a very important chairperson. That's the House Foreign Affairs Committee. His seat is threatened. The burgeoning uncertainty over Engel's re-election is just the latest of an upending of politics as usual in the Democratic Party. The most famous upset of a Democratic congressional incumbent by a progressive primary challenger came in 2018 when now Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez shocked the political classes by unseating a machine-backed Queens Democrat and landing on Capitol Hill. Engel, who has now served 16 terms in Congress, that's 32 years. Time to retire, Elliot's 32 years. Go home and eat some ice cream. Is facing two primary challengers next June. Uh, at Jamal Bowman, a middle school principal from the Bronx, who's endorsed by the progressive group Justice Democrats. Okay, and um, 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 and um, uh, Gibreg Georgis. Cannot pronounce it, folks. That one is too difficult for me without knowing the language. A special education teacher born to parents who immigrated to the U.S. from uh, Eritrea. <clears throat> if you don't know, is right next to um, um, Ethiopia and uh, Somaliland. Or maybe Somaliland now okay, is Eritrea. I'm not, I'm not certain. Got to look it up. The new poll from the, from the progressive think tank, Dave for Progress, which is aligned with Bowman, with uh, Jamal Bowman, that is, Survey 578 registered Democrats in New York's 16th district between September 9th and 13th. Half of the registered Democrats in the district said they were not sure how to describe Engel's political viewpoint. They don't know. If the primary were held today, 29% said they would vote for Engel, and 10% they would said they would support uh, Bowman. 1% said they would vote for Gibra Georgis. Bowman's campaign has raised 189000 to Engel's 566200 and Gibra Georgis has raised 67400 so far. I think even if the big money starts coming in for Engel, that that 189000 by Bowman is a really good start. With a lot of the campaign still to go, he could easily end up with 500,000. That is enough, based on Ocasio's example uh, in the New York 14th, if I recall correctly. Uh, that is enough to beat Engel with a strong ground campaign Okay, even if Engel ends up raising $1.5 million for his campaign. The three-to-one advantage is not enough for Engel in fundraising. Uh, okay, so Jabre Georgis has raised 67400 so far. 
that is probably too little at this point uh, to win. The poll results um, um, have represented a relatively slim lead for such an entrenched incumbent. It is a slim lead. It's very, very low when the guy has been in Congress in that district for 32 years. It indicates nobody knows him, that he hasn't been doing anything for people, so they don't know him. The poll results represented a relatively slim lead for such an entrenched incumbent, and progressive activists see the weakness as an opening for one of the challenges. Quote, this is a wide open race. Engel is extremely vulnerable, and Jamal has a long time uh, middle school principal in the district has the momentum and record of service to win this, said uh, Alexandra Rojas, um, who's the executive director of Justice Democrats. Yes, she is. Over his three decades in Congress, Engel has built a reputation for being hawkish on foreign policy and friendly toward Wall Street. Like many other Democrats, he voted for the Iraq War, 1994 crime bill, and to repeal parts of Glass-Steagall on Wall Street. Engel initially opposed the Iran uh, but, um, had nuclear deal, but now says he supports it. Bowman is busy hitting Engel for his hawkish policies. The Challenger's website says his campaign is about supporting schools and education, not bombs and incarceration. He's in favor of Medicare for All, a Green New Deal, and reforming the criminal justice system. In other words, he's a Sanders Democrat. Bowman pledged to refuse corporate PAC money and has criticized Engel's reliance on PAC money and large dollar contributions. Definitely a Sanders Democrat. And Jabregior just said that the poll shows a vulnerability. Quote, well, what does it say that a 16-term incumbent can't count on the support of even one in three voters in the district? Unquote. Question mark. <clears throat> Quote again. From my conversation with voters across the district, I know that they want an end to politics as usual. Big money and special interests, forever wars, mass incarceration, housing unaffordability, and income inequality. They want new leadership and transformational change from someone homegrown. We are the only campaign that has a detailed platform and vision rooted in economic, racial, environmental justice and international solidarity, um, unquote. <clears throat> the primary is still eight months away, and it's normal for a large portion of voters to still be undecided, but the fact that the voters in the district can't describe the political ideology of an official who has represented the district not just the state, the district, for some 30 years, underscores the argument made by both challengers that he's lost touch with his constituents. Actually, it hasn't been totally for 30 years. He's been in Congress for 80 years, but he represented the 16th district since 2013, holding seats in the 17th and 19th district before that, he was a New York State Assemblyman from 1977 to 88 when he was first elected to Congress. <clears throat> so he was first elected to Congress two years before Bernie, if I recall correctly. And many people in his district don't know his name. At this stage in the race, Engel's lukewarm standing sets up a promising path for Bowman as momentum builds behind a number of primary challenges in neighboring districts and across the country. In comparison, with three weeks left to go before Ocasio-Cortez's 2018 primary, the incumbent's internal polling had him up by 36 points. The primary in the 16th district 
is one of Justice Democrats' top priorities this cycle, along with challenges to other powerful members of the House in Massachusetts, Texas, and Ohio, among others. Half of respondents in the district describe themselves as liberal or very liberal. 38% say they're moderate. 25% are desc- uh, have described uh, Engel uh, as moderate. If half of the Respondents in the district have described themselves as liberal or very liberal. Then, it seems to me that Engel doesn't have much chance in this primary and that um, that Jamal Bowman has a very good chance to sweep in if he can get um, his message out. If he already has nearly 200,000 raised, and we know, and we do know already, he's going to have the support of AOC. I think Engel would do well to announce his retirement at this point and save everybody a lot of trouble. He's another one who should go home and eat some ice cream. Quote, Bowman has been able to break through more than Jabred Georges and commands more support in the horse race and higher name identification, unquote. The poll, however, reported that 59% of respondents still said they'd never heard of Bowman, and 75% said the same for Jabred Georges. Now, what percent uh, haven't heard of Engel? <laughs> uh, did I go over that at the beginning of the article? Let's see. <clears throat> Maybe they know him, but they don't know him. Only 25% uh, think he's a moderate. He obviously thinks he's a moderate. No, I didn't miss anything. Okay, so let me switch back to the basic view here. And go back to check in with you on Facebook. Okay, I see you all now. Uh, So Greg says, Yang also said he's open to taking corporate cash from super PACs. I noticed that. That he would be open to be on the ticket with Biden and also backtrack on support for Medicare for All. Yeah, I know he did. He looks like He's lining up in the center, thinking that he can go further that way. Because what's basically happening is nobody really thinks that uh, that it's going to happen uh, for uh, for Buttigieg. He is too too far apart, actually, from the minority voters. He's not going to keep on gaining. I think. I think the writing's on the wall there. I think uh, the writing is on the wall for Biden. Now, Yang may think if he can support Biden 
and go along with Biden and help to stop uh, the slippage of Biden, uh, then maybe he can be the nominee for vice president. I don't really think so, though. I think Biden is going to try to nominate a woman. Amber Lee says, hi, Dr. Joe. Hi, everyone. Hi, Amber Lee. Hi to you. And hi, Bill Peoples. Thank you for coming. And Jim Bird says... Our, the tax return bureaucracy system. Uh, that's not as bad as many bureaucracies actually to deal with. If you've had any actual experience okay, in dealing with them. Uh, I've dealt with certain of the bureaucracies over the years that are a lot worse. Steve says, I hope everyone is having a fantastic evening. Jim Bird says, or <laughs> Steve Wolfram says, good evening, Dr. Joe. Sarah Marie has joined. Kathy Langan has joined. Matt Waldy has joined. Steve Gonzo has joined. Hi, everybody. Rich Serber has joined. Hi, Rich. And hi, Barbara Wernig. And hi, Jay Elias. And Jay Elias, I hope I've got your name correctly, Jay says, howdy, Joe. Nancy Gosling Blackmar has joined. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Gigi. And Meltemi X, subversive join. Hi, Meltemi X. Jim Bird has joined. The wealthy seldom return their SS payments or elects not to draw Social Security. In fact, the wealthy usually pays just enough in to collect the maximum monthly Social Security payments. Yep, I wouldn't expect them to return their basic incomes to the Treasury. <laughs> Jim Bird says, I know farmers that figured the minimum to the penny and are multimillionaires. Or the minimum what? <laughs> Jim, the minimum what? Jim says, Yang just picked a number and didn't really think through the technical parts. He's directly buying votes. He's trying to prove a Republican okay, at a neoliberal talking point about uh, uh, Bernie's platform. It could be. I mean, it could be. Because Yang really comes over to me as a neoliberal and as a Republican, he doesn't come over to me as any progressive that I've had any contact with over the years or whose writings I've read over the years. Hey, Deborah, how you doing? Bernie's the only viable candidate for the people. None of the others come close. But if thinking corporations are more important than we the people, maybe Elizabeth Warren is the person for you. But we'll be getting the same crack that we've been getting for the last four decades. Neoliberalism equals death. Yes. I don't think there are too many here who are probably for Elizabeth Warren. Jim says, the current Medicare system discriminates against disabled and people with pre-existing conditions and those of the people that need the money the most would pay the highest pay premiums. That may be, Jim, but the Medicare for All system is not going to discriminate against them at all. No co-pays, no deductibles, and no premiums. Margot Shepard is joined and says, are these two going to split uh, the progressive uh, vote? Uh, well, they will for a while. I think, though, I think in the end, Bernie's going to win because I think he has the stronger campaign and the stronger ground game. For now, he has the stronger fundraising, too. But I think that in the longer run, in a bit longer run, 
that Warren will also prove to be a formidable fundraiser, but she'll be raising her funds, even though they come in small donations, uh, from those who were really attracted to Hillary Clinton. I think she's going to have a tough time uh, making substantial inroads um, into the black um, community. I think the Hispanic um, community is going to prefer um, Sanders. And I think uh, large parts of the Democratic Party are also going to prefer Sanders over the primary period. So I think if Joe Biden can be beaten now and early, that it's going to come down to a choice between Bernie and Warren. And I think Bernie's going to have a chance to win. Oh, Jim is talking about the minimum Social Security buy-in. And so he's saying he knows farmers who saw to it that they paid in only the minimum Social Security buy-in. In other words, they paid themselves wages sufficient to get the minimum Social Security buy-in. And then after that, uh, they siphoned it all to profits and took their income as profits uh, rather than as, um, um, as wages. So... And Jim said, laugh out loud. My comments were in context to your conversation. I'll try to give context from now on. Uh, thanks, Jim. <laughs> okay. So. Seems like we're down to last call now. So let me flash my please share, like, and subscribe screen, and please become a Patreon at www.patreon.com slash Joe underscore Firestone. And let me ask for your final comments or questions, and I'll consider those before we sign off uh, for the night. Hmm. Okay, I'll wait for some seconds to see if you have anything more. I'll refresh my page to see if you have anything more. Okay, thanks for joining again, folks. I was in the middle of last call for comments and questions. No, I'm not frozen. And I'm no longer peering at the screen. So thanks for coming, and thanks for sharing, and uh, but thanks for being here with me tonight. The next time I see you will be on Saturday night, hopefully. I'll see you.
I hope, okay, that you'll be there. I certainly intend to be there at roughly 9 p.m. on Saturday night. I'll be off tomorrow. And thank you for coming, Kathy, and thank you for sharing. Kathy says, thanks, Joe, and good night. And Dolores says, thank you, and good night. And thank you for coming. And as always, Dolores, you are always here. Thank you very much for that. So, good night again. Have a great day tomorrow. And I'll see you on Saturday. I'm sorry to hear that you're already cold. I once went to, um, to Iowa, Central Iowa. I, was it Central Iowa? Anyway, it was Ames, Iowa. Uh, I once went there for an interview at um, um, Iowa State University for a possible full professorship. Uh, it was um, early January, and all I can remember is how cold it was in Iowa in early January, in Ames, Iowa, okay, in early January. And the other thing, okay, that I remember is that at one point they took me out to dinner. Okay, and they took me to a steak place, of course. So being on an interview, I thought, well, uh, you know, I want to be modest. So I ordered a... Uh, as I recall, it was a top sirloin steak, and it wasn't prime. It was choice. And let me tell you, I think that that um, Iowa steak was the very best steak that I ever tasted in my life. Prime or no? Choice or no? That steak was the juiciest and the most flavorful and perfectly cooked. All I can remember, <laughs> all I can remember is that great steak and how cold it was in Iowa. I also remember there were nice people, okay, in the department. And so that was very good too. But, and it was a good school. It was a good school. But I sure wondered about uh, those winters. And I wasn't coming from a warm place. Uh, at the time, okay, I was in Binghamton, New York which isn't really known for being that warm. But boy, Iowa in January. I don't envy folks who have to campaign there for the presidency <laughs> because the primary is going to be in early February. Good luck to them all. Did they offer you the job? No, they didn't offer me the job. They did not offer me the job. No, I think I turned out to be too much of a theoretician for them. And too much of a radical theoretician. See, at that time I was into value theory. I've always been into it. I'm still okay, a little bit into it. And they were people who believe strongly in value-free political science. So I think I was just a little too strange for them, as I was to uh, also a number of other schools. Uh, that uh, had me interview 
at uh, that time. And so as a result of not fitting, of the stuff I was working on not really fitting, I ended up in Washington, D.C. in um, 1975, uh, working at government contracting places here. And my whole career since that time has been here in contracting and consulting and in, uh, in uh, the research places without endowments, my own that I set up and was able to make a relatively modest living in for some years. And Steve said, I think that's a good thing to be. We need big opinions. Well, thank you, Steve. <laughs> yes, I always uh, shared your view that we need big opinions. And I was always one to um, try to present uh, really, really big opinions. But let me tell you, uh, those are not, generally speaking, the preferred opinions, as I think Bernie Sanders knows. But it finally looks like his ship may yet come in. And that would be wonderful for all of us. So on that note, I'm going to leave you. And I'm going to say good night. And I'm going to download this video. And I'm going to upload this video to YouTube. And then I'm going to wind down for the night. So you have a really good night too.